Thank you, and uh, welcome to the, uh, um, well, the only presentation which will probably have a balancer and a two drink minimum. <laughs> Sorry, the jazz band uh, took a smoking break and they never came back. So, um, yeah, that's us. Um, my name is Andy Dale, um, and up until about a month ago, uh, I had a brewery named after me, um, and uh, so that's uh, that's part of the story. Um, anyway, my name's Andy Dale, uh, and uh, I am one of the partners at the brewery, and uh, I'm the CFO, and uh, and then Karen, who happens to be my, my wife as well. We're, we're partners in more than one way. Um, so I'm Karen McMillan, and I'm one of there are three of us who own and operate Dale Brothers Brewery. Um, I oversee marketing, the tap room, and kind of the administrative operations of the brewery. Okay, so uh, you know what? We didn't start out as last name brewing, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and uh, just to give you a little bit of history, uh, the, the whole thing was started by my brother, uh, 13 years ago, yes, it took us 13 years to get this figured out, but 13 years ago, this is my brother, Kurt. Um, this is his original brew system. The, all you beer snobs out there that know something about brewing, um, how big is that? Not very big, uh, very small. Um, but he started out small, he started as a sole proprietor. Um, he brought along his logo that he had been using as a home brewer um, and that he had designed himself. Um, and you know what? It's funny because his last name was Dale, um, and uh, so there seemed to be a little tie-in with the um, the Dale Brothers brand. It seemed like a logical place to start out. Um, anyway, go ahead. Ah. And so uh, Kurt uh, started up, and uh, Kurt was uh, really into the craft of brewing. Uh, Kurt was not into the business part of it. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, actually, this vehicle didn't exist until years later. Um, let's see when we actually had money to buy a vehicle. Uh, but uh, Kurt started the business, and the business did grow, but after four years, um, he was really only doing $40,000 a year in revenue. Um, and uh, that's a tough way to make a business, uh, make a living. So uh, uh, about uh, 2007, uh, Karen and I, who do have business backgrounds, uh, Karen has uh, has uh, experience with marketing and distribution. Um, I came out of the technology sector um, and have an MBA and all that that stuff. Um, we joined the business to see if we could take what Kurt's craft was and actually build it into a business. Um, and that started in 2007. Um, and then somewhere around, go ahead. Um, 2009, um, somebody showed up at our doorstep. It was this guy <laughs> right there. There he is. He's right back there. Suspect identified. Um, and uh, he showed up saying, hey, we love your brand. Uh, we love what you're doing. Um, and um, well, we'd like to help you update it. And uh, it's just, oh, great. Another guy that wants another, another piece of our whopping $40,000 a year pie. <laughs> So anyway, but uh, he said he would go and, and give us some concepts and take it to take a look at to, to help build our brand. Um, and so we said, okay, why not? Let's go. And so Mike put his team on, on the task and uh, this is where we this is where we ended up. Uh, and so you saw the old logo. Um, and we came up with something. One of the really, really cool things that they came up with was um, anybody that was familiar with our brand already would look at this and they know it's Dale Brothers. So there was no overall change to the kind of feel of it. It was the look that changed. Um, we, uh, we took the chance to update our beer, uh, beer labels. One of the problems we had with our beer labels other than our logo that was homemade was that they disappeared on on, on uh, store shelves. So we updated all that. And we also adopted these two guys right here. Uh, these are our black sheep. Um, yes, and <laughs> we, we should give a shout out to Dia at Echo Factory who came up with these guys. Uh, yes. Do you want to talk about how they started? 
Well, yeah, so, uh, well, with these guys, uh, you, because, well, the short story is, um, most families only have one black sheep, we actually have two. So, <laughs> we're both not in the rural industry. So, not only that, but we, so we not only got the nice look and feel that Dia and her team put together, but Echo Factory helped us with this overall story about who we are, what we're trying to do. Um, that's obviously the one sentence version. And, and I'm going to just add another sentence to that. Um, so the, when Echo Factory was working on the redesign, they presented some label concepts, and each label concept had something different kind of going on in the top part of the um, diamonds. Uh, in the very first iteration of these guys, they were kind of stick figures. And in fact, we thought they were Tweedledee and Tweedledum. They, they looked like they had propeller hats on. Um, and as we kind of reviewed the designs and talked with Echo Factory, we kind of kept coming back to those guys. And, and Dia at some point revealed they were sheep, um, which was kind of charming. And we said, you know what? We, we keep going with this. We'd like to see where it ends up. And it, and it came out with this, which we absolutely love. Like, and we've loved them more and more and more as time has gone on. And everybody on our staff loves them. Like we now are a herd of black sheep. And um, it's just become a really important part of our identity. And the fact that it sort of got there through an intuitive process, I think, has been, uh, it's kind of indicative of how we have operated as a company. Right. So. Yeah. And uh, I thought the original sheep actually, I, I called them two portly dudes with hats on. Um, but uh, yeah, but this was, uh, these are the guys that uh, we ended up with. And believe it or not, one brother has a preference about which sheep he actually is. But <laughs> the taller, skinnier one. Um, here, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so I think I'm up next. Okay. Okay. Just saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so about 2014, we had been living with this branding for a few years, and the company had been growing um, quite fast at that point for us. And I think I went to a craft beer conference and attended a trademarking seminar where the idea of trademarking your company name came up. And I thought, oh, huh. Maybe we should do that. And then we had talked about it kind of internally early on, but we were all under the impression that if it was your name, you didn't have to trademark it. Um, so I raised my hand and said, but if it's your name, you don't have to trademark it, right? And the lawyer giving the presentation said, uh-uh. <laughs> Not if you use it in your branding. Um, so that was kind of a light bulb moment for us. So we decided like, okay, we, we're big now. We're real, we need to do this. So we sent off an application to the trademark uh, office in Washington, and it was denied. Um, and we were shocked. <laughs> um, we had, <laughs> it was such a moment of realizing just how small and naive we were. Um, because there is another Dale in craft brewing. Does anybody know who that is? Exactly. Um, there is a huge craft brewery in Colorado called Oscar Blues, and they have a flagship brand called Dale's Pale Ale, which was actually one of Andy Dale's favorite beers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> we never connected those dots. Um, trademark office connected it for us, um, and it was, you know, a shock. We went through many, many, many stages of grief. Um, we did not know what to do. We contacted, uh, we have a great craft beer attorney. Um, we contacted her. She said, hey, reach out to Oscar Blues. Maybe they'll let you license the name in your area. You know, if it, what's, you know, think about what your goals are for your company. If you want to stay a local LA um, company, maybe they'll just license it for your territory. So we reached out to Oscar Blues. What happened? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they were very nice, <laughs> but um, they made the point that it weakens their mark if they license anybody to use it. They weren't going to tell us, they weren't going to ever send us a cease and desist, or they didn't, I mean, I'm being a little generous, they never promised to never send us a cease and desist, <laughs> but they said, they um, talked about how they've actually had some of their own trademarking issues with beer names that they've had, um, and talked us through those stories of how that worked out for them. And kind of, you know, put an arm around our shoulders and said, you know what? Maybe you want to find a new name. That, that really might be the best thing for you guys. Um, which made us very angry. 
at first. <laughs> and we had to go through the stages of grief all over again. Um, yeah. But then we kind of got serious and we thought, you know what? We are, we're a legitimate business. We have plans to grow. This is silly. We need to get on with this. Um, so we started reaching out to some experts that we knew, um, one of whom is a uh, branding expert at the um, Drucker School of Management at Claremont Graduate University. We had a meeting with her, and her advice was, don't panic, it's just a name. I mean, she talked us through several other uh, organizations that she'd known who had done this before, um, and she introduced the idea that your customers don't link to you because of your name, they link to you because of the attributes of your brand. And what are those attributes of your brand? And that's what you want to preserve, and don't worry so much about the name. She also, her other big piece of advice was, do it now, um, because if you plan to grow, it's only going to get harder as you get bigger. Um, so we went back to our friends at Echo Factory. <laughs> we had done such great work, but they'd been working with us all along, um, but they were definitely our very next stop. And they, um, they reiterated all the same things that uh, our branding consultant had, had said to us. They said, don't panic, it's just a name. Um, you have so much going for you, this could actually be an opportunity, which was a, that was a, a great kind of eye-opening moment for us when, when they talked us through, you know, the advantages this could give us. We could get some publicity out of this. Um, and it also gave us a chance to revisit some of our branding after a few years it had been out. Um, so we got down to work and we thought about, well, what's important to us in finding a new name? Um, obviously, number one on the list, it needed to be unique and we needed to be able to trademark it in beer which is getting increasingly difficult for anybody who's in, if familiar with craft beer, um, it has absolutely boomed over the last few years, and every name you can imagine is in use yeah. with craft yeah. beer. Just, uh, just to give you an idea, last year there was an average of 1.5 breweries going in every day um, in the United States, um, but that took us up to about 4,500 breweries as of last month. Every brewery has about 20 beers on average that, they, that they're serving. Um, and a lot of them are in for a wake-up call similar to us. Um, but, uh, but that's, you know, you, you, we got 90,000 names out there associated with beer. And then you have to take into account the wine industry as well because the two are in the same, are linked together in terms of trademarking. Yeah, which doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, and, and then we wanted something that would be like, like that first branding transition that was gonna be a very smooth a kind of look and feel was gonna stay the same so that we weren't gonna confuse our customers. We wanted to keep the same diamond logo, we wanted to keep the same colors, the same feel. Um, and then also we wanted to find something that really felt like us. And, and our brand we feel like is fun, it's friendly, it's inclusive. Um, so with that, we kind of just put a big list up on a, a Google Docs, I think it was, some sort of shared server that all the folks at Echo Factory and all the people on our team, we just kind of kept throwing names up there. We ended up with something like 50 names. Um, top of the list, Black Sheep Brewing. Wouldn't that have been awesome? We loved that idea, but guess what? Somebody has it. Exactly. There is a black sheep brewing. It is taken. We couldn't do that. Baba black sheep to us. So once somebody uses something like black sheep in brewing, you can't use any iteration of it in terms of the name. And same with Dale. Like people came to us afterwards and like, well, why didn't you? Why didn't you say you know Dale this brewing or Dale that brewing? How about D Ale? Yeah, exactly. Somebody somebody came up with that. Nope. Yeah, trademark office would not have. It's sort of, at some point you can get crafty enough that if you get the right person at the trademark office, they might say, okay, that's okay, but it really comes down to you don't know who you're going to get. And, and truthfully, the thing that I kept coming back to was there was confusion in the marketplace. We got calls every single day from people thinking we made Dale's Pale Ale and we distributed pa oh. Dale's Pale Ale. And I'm sure Oscar Blues was so tired of asking, answering questions about, you know, Pomona Queen that <laughs> it was just, it's confusing to the customers. And, and so that's the real reason behind trademarks is, is you want to have a clear brand. You want people to know your story um, and not have to wonder who's, who's behind it. Um, so. We went back to our list, we had 50 names, lots of them dropped off the list because they either didn't feel right or they were already taken. Um, hang on, I'm sorry, I have to go to my cheat sheet. Um, at some point we thought, should we just be a symbol? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for that. So that one's available now. <laughs> 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 Uh, it got pretty frustrating at some points, um, but Mike and Dick kept bringing us right back down to the or saying, don't panic, it's just a name. And I, I clearly remember Mike saying, um, saying that, like, you just don't have to worry about it, it's just a name. People, pe as long as you stay true to your brand, people will follow. Um, so there had been a name that was kind of at the very bottom of the list, and we all thought it was kind of a joke throwaway name as we were going through the list, but every time we got to it, it made us chuckle. And as we kept going through the list and trying out different names and seeing how they felt and seeing if they were available, it kind of kept rising further up on the list. Um, and as you know, we decided we would go with last name. You guys get it. Very clever. <laughs> there's a story um, in there. <laughs> exactly, there's a story in there. The re we realized the reasons we liked it, well, number one, it was unique, it was trademarkable, it was not in use in beer. Um, it was going to easily transition with our branding, and it felt like us, and it had this added benefit to us of referring back to our company's origins. So we didn't feel like we were going to completely abandon who we were, it was more of an evolution of, of who we were. Um, so, we decided on that. We ran it by our lawyer, Candace. she's wonderful. Um, she approved, she checked it out, we trademarked it, it was ours. And so then we went on to um, have Echo Factory start to work it into our branding. Which they did. Um, yes, so uh, this is kind of all the iterations, all the variations of our, of our logo that we're using. Um, and uh, one of the great things, so uh, once again, uh, you look at this logo and if you're driving by and you happen to pass our billboard and hopefully aren't spending a lot of time reading behind the wheel, um, the, uh, once again, you're going to recognize our brand. There's not going to be any, any question about who this is. Um, the other great thing is all of this is now registered. Um, even these guys, these guys are now <laughs> registered. Uh, two black sheep are registered. Uh, and so these, uh, we have these going on for different things. We've got this going on our t-shirts. We've got this uh, going on uh, for our van graphics and, and our uh, main logo. And so uh, we were able to come up with, or Dia and her, her team were able to come up with something for every occasion. Um, the other cool thing is that we got to revisit our uh, bottle labels once again. Um, and so this just kind of shows the evolution of our bottle labels. Believe it or not, we actually used to print these out on a laser printer and cut them out by hand. Um, such was our volume at that point. Um, and uh, actually glued them on by hand. Um, and, uh, but this was the original logo that came up. Uh, so uh, with the original logo, there was nothing up here in the main logo. And then we had a little uh, a crown in this case. Something up there that identified it with the actual beer. Um, Echo Factory took that way up to the next level, uh, kept the crown up here, brought out the name, obviously much more of a shelf presence there, and with 4,500 breweries out there, there are plenty of people that are trying to get your attention on tap handles and shelves these days. Um, what it gave us, what it really gave us the opportunity to do though, was actually go back and check one more time what we want to do with with our logo, what we finally want to be when we finally grow up after 13 years, um, which is the same question my son is asking right now. Um, and so uh, what we didn't have on this was the consistency of our friends, the black sheep up here. And so uh, even though we had a consistent look and feel, they, were no, they somehow had missed the bus um, and were not on the labels. So again, uh, uh, Echo Factory came back, put them back up there, and slid this down so that each one of the beers has its own look, its own avatar, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that was a really cool thing. Next. Oh, sorry. Uh, and that went for all of our beers. And so Between now them. we've got, we got our friends on every bottle. We've got consistent branding. Uh, and we feel like we really have something that we can move forward with 
um, uh, for, the, with, for the long haul here. Um, so, and so you may think that by now we had learned every lesson that we could possibly learn and we couldn't trip over or make any more screw-ups. You're wrong. <laughs> so. so yeah, so we had to had to plan. Now we had all the branding set. How are we going to roll this out to the public? Um, and our awesome friends at Echo Factory helped us out again. Um, and they suggested let's do like a month long uh, transitional campaign where we uh, capture people's attention. And they came up with this great idea. Let's put a Spencer logo right across the logo. We can make funny jokes about lawyers. You know, get everybody kind of in on it and laughing. We said, that is so great, let's do that. We had them design it, we had it printed up. We called Oscar Blues to say, don't you wanna give us a quote for our press release about our name change? Here's all this great stuff we're doing. And they took one look at this and they said, oh no you don't. <laughs> and in hindsight, they were right. Um, that was a little bit of a slap. <laughs> uh, they were worried, of course, that people were gonna think that they had forced us into something, which was never the case. Um, and so we panicked a little bit. Um, we went to our lawyer again to say, what, what, you know, what happened? And we showed this to her and she said, wait a minute. She said, Lagunitas has a beer that's called Censored. <laughs> and it's trademarked. <laughs> and they are very protective of their trademarks. You should have, not do this. That's why they have Heineken money now, too. So. <laughs> Exactly. So we had to throw that campaign out the window. Um, it was another like, oh, yeah. you know, really? If anybody's looking for 40,000 coasters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> eBay collector's items. No more stains on your table. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, again, it's, we, we are the classic example of, um, of falling into that hole many times before we learn that the hole is there. Um, and hopefully now we've we've got this figured out that any major marketing that we do, we're, we're going to run that by the <laughs> trademark experts first. Um, but again, luckily our friends at Echo Factory had another great idea in their hip pocket, which was, let's put a Hello My Name is sticker on the logo. That's much friendlier. Um, and we ran that by our lawyer first. And she's, she, believe it or not, it is in use in beer, but it is not <laughs> trademark. <laughs> And it is in use in very small local instances. So she said, for this one month campaign that you're planning, you're good to go, just go with it. So we did, um, we put it on, this is what our billboard used to look like. So we had a snipe created to go over the logo. We added the little snipe at the top saying, what's brewing? We put it on our coasters with the something's brewing at Dale Brothers. Because um, the goal was to really get a conversation going, get people's interest peaked. And we launched this on April 1st because we wanted people to think it was an April Fool's joke at first. <laughs> and, and some of them did, but most of them were pretty smart um, and figured out, uh, I would say a, a lot of them figured out there's probably going to be name change. The thing that we were really, there were two things we were really worried about um, uh, that could have led to like negative backlash. And, and one of them was that, um, that maybe we'd been bought by Budweiser, which is a huge issue in, in craft beer right now. The, the little craft brewery is getting bought up by the big guys, and then that's not good. The next signal. <laughs> so, um, so we really kept an eye out for those kind of comments. We have a great um, social media marketing person on our staff, and she kept an eagle eye out for anybody who started to go down that road, and she, she steered those conversations. You know, That was the one thing we decided we were going to address right away. We were pretty happy to let people just speculate all they wanted to on social media. But if that one question came up, we were gonna immediately respond saying, nope, we haven't been bought. We are still the same people making the same beer. Um, and the goal was to get people to come to an event at our brewery at the end of the month to figure out what, um, what was going on. And so that event happened on April 30th. Yep. And uh, well, we're in the brewing business. We kind of self-selected into the brewing business. And uh, well, we frequently have parties. Um, and this was a really good party. Um, but uh, yeah, and despite the fact that we had a one month lead in, um, I was kind of, a, I kind of assumed that it would just be common knowledge, that the name would be common knowledge, the, what, you know, what was going on would be common knowledge. Uh, first of all, there were a surprising number of people that actually showed up to the event that wanted to know what was going on, wanted to be a part of it. Um, secondly, it was amazing how few people actually knew what was what we were about to announce. 
Um, and third, it was amazing how many people thought we'd been bought by Budweiser. Um, because apparently having tap handles all the way out to Fontana was some kind of big draw for them. Um, but uh, that's not what happened. And we, uh, we had an event on April 30th. Uh, that's my brother again, the updated version of my brother. Um, and uh, when we, uh, the great thing was we, uh, we did a three, two, one countdown oh, four or five times just to, to do the, uh, to keep the uh, secret a little bit longer. Um, but when we finally did reveal, um, there was a little gasp, and then there was like a cheer and and laughing and stuff like that. Like people immediately got it what what we were talking about and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there were one or two guys out there that were just like that sucks, but um, <laughs> you're always going to get those people. Um, and uh, you know, we just yeah, just in terms of uh, the new branding. Um, really people were just like, we don't care what you call yourselves as long as the beer is the same and the place is the same. You know, what they were really telling us was we provide an experience to them and as long as that experience doesn't change, you can change your name all you want, although it's really expensive, don't do it. Um, and, um, but uh, that's what it's all about. And so we, we felt like we got a whole lot of support from our, from our customers. Um, we uh, decided to do a kind of anti-teaser uh, campaign and uh, uh, this is something again that Echo Factory came up with and just to um, kind of emphasize that uh, and to draw people's attention to the new name, uh, they did this little racer mark thing and kind of wrote it in there, wrote the new name in there um, and so just so that people can't just look at the coaster, go oh whatever, throw it to the side um, and also uh, it gives actually a pretty complete story about what uh, what's going on with our brand and where to find more information on the on the brand as well and the rebranding and so um, and then uh, That's this billboard. we updated our billboard just to make it really clear for everybody you know we've changed but only the name has changed um, and people seem to really be rolling with that it's been really gratifying to have gone through this whole process, gotten the name out there, and had those great social media responses, 90% of them have said some variation of, it's just a name. We, you know, we like you guys, we like the beer, we like the experience, no big whoop. Um, so that's, that's, that's been, that's our story. And we're sticking with it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Oh, it was entertaining and insightful, and I had no idea that trademarking would be such um, a challenging endeavor to overcome. Uh, so as I understand it, as we're going to do Q&A, there's also going to be samples poured for everyone here, because we're so kind I just got this sneak eye from the character, she's like, what? Uh, I actually thought that there was somewhere, and then we was like... Oh, I didn't even hear. Because it's eight o'clock in the morning. Yes, yes. <laughs> you guys ever see the Drew Carey show where they had uh, they had Buzz beer, where they had like caffeine and beer? That that might be legit. <laughs> I know it sounds horrible. It's a sitcom. Anything goes. There are beers like that. Yeah. Oh, okay, so I'm sure this is gonna spark a debate. Uh, in any case, we are gonna open up to Q and A. We're gonna walk around with the mic. If you have a question, raise your hand. We will hopefully get it answered by our amazing uh, uh, presenters here. Wow, hands already. But uh, if you have comments or stories you'd like to share, please save it for offline. Will you guys stick around for a little bit to interact sure. further? Great, so questions now, comments later. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my question is, um, if you had done your um, um, trademarking research early enough and you had found that you would have complications using the Dale name, would you still have changed the name of the brand or would your ego have gotten in the way <laughs> and have still tried to keep the brand and pursued it? Yeah, um, I think we were coming at it with sufficient naivete that we didn't actually just, I, I went to the University of Chicago for my MBA and in a marketing course there, um, I actually remember a professor telling me that nobody can tell you you can't use your name in a, in a trademark. Oh, no, man. Um, you don't go to the University of Chicago for marketing. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. More of a finance 
cool. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, honestly, I think uh, in the first few years, there was no real reason to, yeah. to do it. And as a matter of fact, for the first six months after we found out that the trademark had been uh, turned down, we actually just put our heads in the sand and said, look, we're, we're only, our entire home turf is only 30 miles in diameter. Um, and we don't need, we, we, if we don't upset the apple cart, everything's good. The problem is we needed to grow. Um, it's a volume business. I'd love to sell one $4 million a year beer and call it a, you know, call it a day on April or on January 2nd. Um, beer business doesn't work that way. So the, the other thing that um, was eye-opening to me in this process was when Kurt started the business in 2003, he wasn't thinking 20 years out. He wasn't thinking, where's this business gonna go? He started the business because he loved making beer. And at that point in time, craft beer was really new in this area. And he thought he could just provide something unique and fun in his area. He had not. And even when we joined, like, we were <coughs> thinking, how big and far do we want this to go? We, we joined because we also love craft beer and we saw an opportunity to build something that would be fun for, for all of us. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, I was curious, did your trademark also cover every individual um, kind of, no, it no. Yeah, for, for now we are trademarked in beer and wine, it's a joint category. Um, I know Stone, somebody, a couple people mentioned Stone. Um, Stone is trademarked in every category. They are trademarked in shirts. They are trademarked in bumper stickers. And at some point, if we get that big, we will do that. Um, but at this point, it's it's too much of an expensive process to go through. And then also, once you have a trademark, you're, you have an obligation to protect it, which means you have to start paying attention to what other people are doing and talk to them if, if they're using your mark in their, in their territory. So. We just don't want to go there right now. Yeah, and we are trademarking. We trademark Pomona Queen, which is by far our biggest brand in the market. Um, represents anywhere from 75 to 80 percent of our uh, sales on a on an ongoing basis, um, and that's that's pretty common amongst a lot of breweries that they have their flagship brand. Um, and uh, actually, one of the reasons that we got into the whole rebranding thing in the first place was actually more people knew the name Pomona Queen than knew the name Dale Brothers. And like uh, when we after we first joined the, the brewery, you know, I'd go to a party and people would say, "Oh, what do you do? What do you do?" Or we, we own a brewery. And it's like, "Oh, what's the name?" It's like, "Oh, it's Dale Brothers Brewery." And then now doesn't sound familiar. It's just like, "Oh, what do you make?" And it's like, "Oh, we, we make Pomona Queen." It's like Pomona Queen. We love that beer. And um, and so it's like, yeah, we kind of, we we kind of make that. Um, and uh, so uh, one of the reasons that. We um, started working with Echo Factories. We need to switch that that equation around. Um, and then uh, at a party, not ironic. We yeah. spent several years getting people <laughs> to know the name Dale Brothers. Luckily, the look was good. Um, but uh, yeah, and there was uh, we got Pomona Queen actually registered really early. Um, yeah. So the question I had had more to do with in the beginning. You said that your gross revenues were forty thousand. So I wanted to know what the economic argument was for trademarking and then how it worked when you did the expenses, did you compute a rate of return? How did that uh, affect your gross sales? So I wanted the money part. Yeah. No, no, and no. Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, let's see, did we do, no, we were in a situation, and as a matter of fact, the situation that uh, Oscar Blues, who owned Dale's Pale Ale, um, uh, communicated to us so um, I'm not revealing any secrets that they uh, uh, a firefighter there they're in Colorado Longmont Colorado and um, they uh, uh, had a uh, start as a local brewery um, a local firefighter who was a fan of theirs unfortunately perished in a, in a fire um, and his name was Gordon Knight um, and so they decided to name a beer after Gordon, and it's, I believe it's a Scottish ale, um, and they went big with it. I mean, this was, they pushed this out, um, and it, it went, uh, it got to California really fast. Um, and then there was another brewery that happens to be called Gordon Biersch mm. that 
said, no, I don't think so. Um, and they actually, rather than playing all nice like we did, they sent them a cease and desist letter, which required Oscar Blues to immediately pull down every can of beer that was on store shelves immediately. Um, and so when you start uh, thinking about doing Excel, Excel spreadsheets um, about this decision, um, it's like, uh, no, we got to get this done now because if we have to pull every bottle of, and change every sign and pull everything off the market today, how much is that going to cost us? Um, and, and how much would it cost us? two years from now with that much growth. So we didn't do hardcore financial analysis. We did, you know, as with the sheep, as with choosing last name, we're kind of, uh, we operate instinctively <laughs> for better or for worse. So we just sort of had a gut that if we're gonna do this, we need to do it, we need to do it now. It's gonna suck, it's gonna cost money, but we need to do it now to allow the company to grow. Um, I can't remember the other pieces of your question. Well, what I was trying to figure out is I mean, in the beginning, what was the point of even trademarking it? Was there a reason that you thought that it would make your sales excel? I mean, right. you know, that yeah. whole thing and using Echo. And yeah. So, so it was really, it was really about protecting ourselves from a future cease and desist that would have required us to pull all of our products um, from the shelves in a short amount of time. Um, and have to deal with it in a much more crisis kind of way, which would have been more expensive and, and more difficult for the company, rather than doing it in a measured, um, careful way early uh, before we got too big. Hang on, I've got two people lined up. Oh, so it seems like if Black Sheep Brewing wants to come into your trade area, they might have some issues. Have you talked to Candace about that? <laughs> yeah, actually, the, the sheep are a design. They are not identified in the trademark as sheep. Um, so they are a, a design that you can do with what you will. Lots of people think they're cows. Um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah I, uh, they are OK. But it, it will not be a problem with Black Sheep Brewing. I feel like Lightning's gonna strike now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you register a design? Yeah, you you can register a design. Yeah. Do so. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, everything uh, everything is trademarked. The um, the sheep are trademarked. The name is trademarked. The logo design is trademarked. Two different things. Registering mm -hmm. and trademark are two different things. Pass the mic. Pass the mic. Sorry. Okay. Here, Gary. Registering and trademark are two different things. So tell me more about that. <laughs> in my organization, we had a logo. Uh -huh. And another organization that is a relative to our organization in fashion wanted to use the same logo. Uh -huh. And we registered our logo because of protection so that it wasn't going to get copied. So people, so we had ownership on it. I, I believe we do. And I'm going to double check that with our lawyer when I leave. But that was, you know, we, we definitely did the name. And then we put through what's called the logo lockup. Um, and then also the sheep. Yeah. So, but I will double check. That. Yeah, a trademark. You can put a TM on just about anything and this try to, to uh, try to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And these are all R with the circle. Everything. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So this yeah. is a bit of a black sheep question. <laughs> um, if somebody, you know, in your organization were to say, "Yeah, caffeine in beer was a really good idea," how would you go about selling it to your craftsmen? Selling it to who? To, to Chuck. Hmm. Oh, to Kurt? To our... To Kurt, right. To Kurt. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, there are lots of... Uh, the, craft, the craft brewers get into the business because they like the creativity, they like the... And uh, given, again, 4,500 breweries, 90,000 beers out there, um, everybody's trying to think of kind of the next thing um, and or a new thing to come out with. Um, I think in terms of what we are as a company and as an experience, um, we actually focus on kind of on the wider side and the more drinkable side of the beer. So up until oh, four, four or five years ago, we didn't even make ales. We only made lagers. And so IPAs, those weren't even in our in our product line. Um, and uh, 
But unfortunately, IPA is the fastest growing segment. It's doubling every three years, um, by far the fastest growing segment. Um, so we really needed to get into that market. Um, so, but that is kind of the soul of the company, or the, is Pomona Queen, California Black Beer, all these very drinkable lager, lager beers. Yes, we do need to come up with some uh, interesting things to keep it fresh. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, last uh, two months ago, we came out with a malted milk bowl, oatmeal, chocolate imperial stout uh, that was at 10 and a half percent um, and left the brewery extremely quickly and now everybody wants malted milk ball, yeah, whatever it was. Um, and we do in fact have a coffee beer. Um, we have uh, kind of made a partnership with, what's the name of that? Uh, there, it's a Espresso Republic. Um, right. Yeah, so they're a so local roastery. Right, they've been providing us coffee beans and um, they're talking about providing us with some cold brew that we've been infusing in coffee. And your question is really, how do those decisions get made? No, it's actually, how do you, if you might, if you come, might. Oh, sorry. If you come close to having a decision, uh -huh. how do you get the, the, the talent on board? So the, so the way it works at our company, and it's not perfect and it's not always smooth, but ideally the way it works is we have a weekly beer meeting with all the main, <laughs> all I know, doesn't that sound great? Yeah. Um, all the main constituents. So we have people from the brew team, we have people from the tap room, and we have kind of the administrative folks and from the distribution end. Um, and the idea there is we've got people who are Direct, directly touching the customers and hearing what the customers are interested in, and we've got the creative people in the brewery. And so we all come together, we talk about some of the regular day-to-day -day of what's happening, what needs to happen, and then we talk about what are people talking about, what are people thinking about, what do we want to do? And ideally, it's a collaborative decision with the group. It doesn't always work that way, <laughs> but that, that's the goal. Yeah. The weekly uh, wine meeting just didn't work out for us, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna do one more question. We've got time for one more question. Here it is. Thanks, Pete. So I'm kind of curious what you guys are doing on the grassroots level, because obviously, you know, you had the big party a couple weeks ago in Upland, that's great, but obviously a lot of restaurants, bars, you know, the stores, liquor stores that you're selling to, you know, they don't know last name from your last name. So basically, you know, even though you have the logo with the diamond shape and the sheep, it's kind of like the Dale Bar's logo you know, with, the, with a new name. What are you doing to get out the word? You know, like it's the same beer, it's just a different name. You know, to like you know, doing tap takeovers or right. you know, like beer week events or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah, you, you kind of hit on it. So our distribution team has been, and this started before we revealed the name. They started going to some of our key retail uh, customers letting them know that it was going to happen, assuring them it was going to be a smooth transition, talking about how we were going to um, approach it in the marketplace. So it didn't hit any of them by surprise. Uh, and then as soon as the name change happened, we went to, actually we went to the very first customer that poured the first Dale Brothers beer, and we gave them the first last name brewing tap. Um, and by and large, we have had the same response from our retail customers that we have seen from our you know, consumers which is no big deal. You know, thank you for letting us know. As long as the beer's not changing, we trust you guys. We know that you guys have had good marketing support in the past. We trust you can have good marketing support through this. And it really hasn't been an issue. We have done things to kind of alert consumers. We've put a neck label on all of our bottles that says, hey, wait a minute, weren't we Dale Brothers? And it says, yeah, we were. Go to this URL to find out more about why. Um, and we've got it on coasters that go to all the retail accounts, and then we are planning to do some tap takeover events. We're out at beer festivals where we're just telling that story, and we expect that for six months or so, we're going to need to just constantly tell that story until it becomes who we are. Right. And one of the advantages of doing it when we did it was um, we were well established in our in our home turf, um, which is only about 30 miles across. Um, basically goes from the 605 eastward uh, and with our little brewery right in the middle of it. Uh, and so it was pretty easy for us to get our story out to our, to our customers, to our customer base. As it turned out, it was very important that we do it right now though, because we just started uh, doing business in, uh, in Orange County and uh, uh, started uh, delivering to 26 Data Brothers locations down there. Um, and so if we had put beer down in Orange County, say, four months ago, and then changed the name, 
that might have been a little bit of a bobble right there. So um, yeah, so it was really important. Tear off the Band-Aid, get it done while you're as small as you are, and, uh, and then grow from there. Excellent. Thank you so much for the questions and answers.